Thank you very much again for the invitation. Uh, this is really a wonderful meeting. Um, I didn't see much of uh, Thessaloniki except uh, tonight uh, uh, event with your mega star, as I heard, Natasha, <laughs> which left me like four hours of sleep tonight, which, <laughs> which is, you know, so so. But it was worth it, definitely. <laughs> um, I felt a little bit like uh, night vision problems this morning, but uh, this is what happens usually with RP. And uh, <clears throat> I would just like to say that uh, I also have some, let's say, English teachers, and although not really on Morphids, but I was at St. Thomas's in 1991, uh, trained by his Professor Hisako Ikeda, who is one of the electrophysiologist, both clinical and experimental, and this is upon her retirement in 91, and you see this illustrious faculty that joined her for the symposium, and I'm quite proud that she was also a PhD mentor to Sam Jacobson, which actually, as you know, is one of those that are writing the future of retinal dystrophy treatments. Um, I would just also like to say that Graham Holder, who was coming regularly to this meeting, is my uh, really good friend, and we, we have been friends for many, many years. And uh, uh, this was in 2015 at ISEV meeting in Ljubljana, which we organized, and Graham had a named Dawson lecture. And um, he's also my good friend, and uh, Petra, my wife, and the daughter, Paula. She, she was two at that time. She's six now. She, she went to the first class just last week, so that's why Petra couldn't join me, but otherwise would happily. Okay, this is a little bit of history, and uh, now we go to, to what um, patients see in the advanced uh, cases, is usually like this tunnel vision. And uh, as you know, clinical signs are disc pallor, narrowing of arteries, uh, atrophy, and uh, pigmentations that are like a bone speckle cells. Now, you know that you have different um, forms of RP. They are transmitted dominantly recessively and X-linked, and uh, X-linked seems to be most aggressive, actually is most aggressive, and, um, <coughs> and um, dominant is least aggressive uh, on the line. So basically dominant, as you can see, they, can stick, they reach... Um, legal blindness at a very advanced age, actually, whilst uh, X-linked, that, that actually is the, the worst one, at about 40s. Um, so gene defects are numerous, and uh, the one that's now being treated is RP65, is one of these little small ones there, so you, you, you don't expect to see many of those. Uh, we still didn't find one, but uh, that should be lurking somewhere. One in million, apparently. We have two million population in Slovenia, so we should have at least two, or maybe, maybe more, or maybe less. Um, and it's RP can also come in syndromic variant, and the most common is Usher's syndrome, which goes along with uh, deafness uh, caused by <coughs> nine genes, and uh, you have typical three uh, forms: Usher one, two, and three and they also affect vision. In Slovenia, Anna Fakin did a PhD on that, and this is where uh, ASHA 1 and 2 were found, and it, sh it actually corresponds pretty well to the density of the population. And uh, what was really unexpected, and this is published, that 92% of our ASHA 2 patient had one single mutation in, in gene W3955X, which means that if once we can find gene treatment for this gene, then all Slovenian ushers will be treated, which is pretty unique in the world, as you can see in this map here. Um, this mutation is not existent in Canada, zero, USA, 2%, United Kingdom, 0.6%, France, zero, Spain, 0.5, Denmark, 1.9, Netherlands, 2.4, Italy, a little bit more, and Germany, a little bit more, and, and uh, percentage of these mutations really high in Slovenia. We don't know about these countries, uh, we don't know about Greece as well, but there are some reports that perhaps it's 
present in, in, high, in high numbers also in Russia, maybe in Czech Republic. So we don't really know whether or not this is a founder effect or was there some Cossack from Don that came over and, uh, you know, made all this. Um, however, it, it can be seen that Slovene women are far more faithful than it's taught, basically. <laughs> Anyway, so <clears throat> we'll talk about the, this uh, RP in terms of a little bit of functional imaging, and Tony will talk about this extensively. So it's an ISO standard flash EIG, which is mass response and shows generalized photoreceptor dysfunction and doesn't necessarily show maculopathies, which are better shown by pattern EIG and multifocal EIG. And uh, Tony will tell you about this more, but just to emphasize that pattern EIG N95 is actually a selective indication of ganglion cell function, whilst multifocal EIG is excellent to tell you if there is a photoreceptor dysfunction, and ganglion cell dysfunction wouldn't affect multifocal EIG, which is particularly useful. And uh, electrodes that are used are many. We develop our own when I was in London, and this, uh, okay, this video doesn't work, but uh, it does work. This is how, how we actually place this electrode in the eye, in the lower fornix. It's a silver wire, which is insulated by Teflon, and can be reused a number of times. And uh, then you, you see the stimulus of the malfocal EIG, and then when it's finished, you can see this nice um, pattern with little, uh, little sort of mathematically composed responses, which are local responses. And if you do this, then you see this central peak, which corresponds to the highest density of the cones in the retina. Um, and this is something what every clinician can understand. Um, so we also use quite a lot of fundus-controlled microperimetry. We use MP1, and also we use quite a lot of autofluorescence ever since it was discovered. And uh, this is what it shows. It's lipofuscin and the photoreceptor is the end product of disc shedding in pigment epithelium. This is lipofuscin, and this is a normal um, distribution of, um, <coughs> of the autofluorescence. And then what you actually do see is the autofluorescence of A2E, which is a chromophore, which is a, actually a, uh, I'd say a derivative of vitamin A. And if it's too much of this, it has been shown to be toxic to the retina. So in contrary to what it was believed that vitamin A is good for the eyes, it's not good for the dystrophies. So it can actually cause toxic effects on the retina. That's something what Tony has, uh, Tony Robson has um, the first to describe the functional, um, I would say, functional importance of this hyperautofluorescence ring that you see in RP. And Tony was the first to see that if you go along the <coughs> retina towards the ring, then function actually ceases within uh, or outside the ring, and it's only preserved inside the ring. And it's particularly difficult to understand that in the cases like this, where you still see nice uh, distribution of lipofuscin, and, and you see this ring here, and there's no function, no function, there's normal function. And Tony has done the first study with uh, pattern EIG. We've been the first to, do, to add multifocal on that uh, two years later. And Petra Popovic, who is sitting there, and I'm glad she's here, she was, she was actually um, the first author, and that was the team of her PhD. So OCT, of course, now tells us much more than it used to. So this is what you see in normal eye, and that's what you see in RPI. And um, this functional significance also corresponds to structural, um, sorry, to structural um, boundaries of the ellipsoid zone here. So that, that corresponds exactly to the outer size of the ring. We don't know exactly how this ring comes about and at what stage, but uh, this is one interesting case at 11 years old uh, in dominant RP. You see this sort of double ring. So there is one ring and there's another one in the periphery. And if you do OCT over this, then you see this normal thickness of the 
photoreceptor layer, which goes somewhat thinner and then normalizes to the periphery again. But this region here is still functioning, as you can see in microperimetry. So it's not, it's not that. So basically, you seem to have this kind of annular uh, decrease of the thickness of the photoreceptor layer that probably extends both ways, but we see also different patterns sometimes. Um, so these very early cases are actually not being studied extensively. And then you can see different stages in the development of the disease, which would actually, a lot of them would cause this sort of paracentral scotoma, which is something that patients actually um, functionally uh, really uh, don't see through that. And basically that's what their vision should be actually measured is this size here. Whilst many, um, you know, formal um, rules in the uh, disabled um, legislation say that you should look for the outer Goldman isopter, which is unfair to these patients because this outer ring here is really not useful for them. So we actually looked at a little bit more specifically into different phenotypes. Uh, and we looked also in natural history because we see these different patterns like ring and no ring and then some other um, pigmentary changes and atrophy. And that is a PhD of Anna Fakin who did this natural history uh, study. Um, and she did this in uh, patients with different stages of the disease. And then she actually looked at the disease duration. And what she could find is really that, that we have sort of a large ring first and goes smaller and smaller and then becomes patch and atrophy in the end. So it seems to be sort of a logic um, sequence of these changes and not probably different phenotype, phenotypic uh, expressions of different forms of RP. And we could also find the same in in other forms of RP, so dominant, recessive, sporadic, not only in ashes. And um, this is what then we composed. So, so this is the natural history. So it starts with large ring, going smaller, and then coming to, to the center, becoming sort of hyper autofluorescent patch in the beginning, which you can see here, which is function is not so good anymore, but there's still some function, point one and then atrophy. And um, this is what Anna wrote very nicely, so the schematic representation of this natural history. And this is longitudinal um, images of the patients in our hospital over eight years. You can see exactly how this ring is coming closer together and how it's changing into patch over seven years and how over six years coming to atrophy. So there are also uh, cases that are much more aggressive. It's a young gentleman eight, born in 82 with X-linked RPGR mutation. And they are, of course, much more aggressive. And they would, they would actually have this uh, event or sequence of events very, very quickly. Then a few other forms that are well known, like enhanced Descon syndrome uh, with this nomula peripheral pigmentations, and uh, many times you see the cystic spaces in the macula, which do not leak, the fluorescent doesn't fill them, but you see them on autofluorescence. So that's a disease that, that actually genetically um, conserves S cones, and uh, you can actually record pretty specific EIGs on them. There would be a slower EIG and cone and maximal response would have the same shape. Um, then one thing that maybe uh, is also quite common is, is PIPH2 mutations or peripherin, um, RDS peripherin mutation. What is fascinating with this mutation is that it can present in the same family with the same mutation with totally different phenotypes. And uh, this is one family, for example, that presented with macular dystrophy in one of the siblings or something macular-like pattern, whatever you would want to call it, in another sibling 
and um, hororetinal uh, and macular dystrophy in another two. And if you look over time, this hororetinal dystrophy progresses um, over time. This is over actually nine years. And you see that this central part is preserved quite long. Then you can also have RP-like Stargardt's disease, which is probably ABCR4-related rod cone dystrophy. Um, so it's visual acuity 1.0 with preservation of the central bit of macula, but a lot of atrophy around it. Um, and I think all of us have some of those, but uh, I don't think that there was a large study on this to see why basically Stargas this sometimes turns around and uh, causes basically uh, macular preservation. Um, maybe Mike can later on comment on that. So. Just to go back to your uh, clinical practice, what can you do for these patients? Because genetic treatment is not available yet, at, at least for most of them. So CME and ERM, so apparatus member, they are quite common. Um, then tozolamide drops, acetazolamide orally, cataract surgery, if exudative, uh, we should look for a regmatogenous uh, detachment. We just recently had a case which looked like exudative form in one eye, and um, we treated him with Diamox, and it, it was really shallow, and it turned a little bit better, and then it developed, he developed uh, PBR. Okay, where's this com coming from? And then, then with indentation, we could find a, a very peripheral hole, so there was a, almost a cause of the, of the juridical um, process, so uh, look for this. If you have this sort of exudative format or form of the disease. So check intraocular pressure regularly as well. Now, um, about prevalence of cystoid macular edema, apparatus membrane cataract, uh, that's another paper that Mike has been actually um, probably leading, and uh, was 338 patients with RP, and CME was very prevalent on a, on a, on a general 50% 50, 50 had it. Bilateral was in 73%, and it was like 71% in dominant, and uh, about 58 in recessive, and, and only about 12 in X-linked. Cataracts were present in 22.8 eyes, and ERM in 11. So um, basically, what is the difference between CME in RP, or dystrophies, and um, the CME that we know from, let's say, uh, UVI this or post cataract situations, it's 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 no leakage. If you do fluorescent, it will rarely leak. You don't see this petaloid, petaloid uh, format, and it's rather diffuse. So it's not quite known what what is actually causing it. Is it pump dysfunction or is it increased capillary permeability, RPE, inflammation? So we are still looking at that. And we did a study in our cohort. It's quite some of this, and uh, we also treat our patients, and we used to treat them mostly with Diamox, and then again a paper from Mike actually showed that that uh, topical dorsolamide is, is far more effective than, than uh, the tablets, which of course patients like much better. And you have different types, and uh, they respond, and they don't respond, and so on, and they, they actually uh, may respond for some time and then stop responding, and then you you're thinking about alternative treatments if you have persistent CME, and, and many of these have been tried. And um, interestingly, also NTVGF actually was tried, and this is one of our cases that stopped responding to Diamox and it had this uniocular uh, edema that actually caused pretty poor vision and metamorphopsia, and she was an architect, and it was in one eye, and she didn't really like it, and one injection actually helped that, and, and it's dry ever since. Didn't happen immediately, but after like three months, and also it was one of the Greek papers that showed these effects on uh, the patients, um, and Mike actually just concluded, I believe, he will tell us a little bit more about that clinical trial with ILEA. And uh, this, of course, is something that is worth think, having in mind uh, and maybe doing some multicenter study. So we looked for this in our cohort of 54 patients and actually found pretty similar numbers that were published by Mike. Uh, 
So it's about 56% of patients as it's recessive had CME. And uh, location was in inner nuclear layer and inner outer nuclear layer, which is slightly different to what it is with uveitis. And you can see these rebounds. If you don't if you stop taking drugs, it will actually would, would increase when it gets better. And then it's when you stop treatment, then it goes, cystoid macroedema goes back and, and visual acuity falls to 0.8, but then again, it can actually increase a little bit if you retreat them if they are. And then cataract is something that is common and it's posterior subcapsular. It's small sometimes, so you don't know whether to operate it or not, but for patients really in RP with two or three degrees of field, this is quite important. It's uh, interesting, it was not, it's not known why patients get cataracts, probably also genetic in a way, but what we did in Ljubljana is we looked for the uh, ultrastructure of the capsules, of anterior lens capsules, and we could see quite a distinct hole in the capsule. So it means that actually the, the pumping mechanism of the anterior uh, capsule and uh, epithelial cells are disturbed and probably water leaks along the fibers to the posterior pole so that you get the cataract. And the cataract has been, uh, it's been controversy in the past. It is good to do it or not, but uh, certainly it's good to do it. But uh, cystoid macroedema can happen. It's not too much of it, but uh, zonular weakness is something that's usual uh, accompanying uh, part of the surgery. And actually um, in our series, we, we got on average about from 0.12 to 0.27 uh, increase in visual acuity, and CME was 5%. Um, what we like to do in patients who don't have very good distance vision is to correct them to minus 3 or even minus 5. We have one photographer who, who likes to, to see the screen, the LCD screen of the camera, and he hates to use glasses for that. So he's happier to actually put glasses for distance and look for the near, so think about that. Then do early YAG to prevent PCO, and sometimes you have very severe phimosis in this, so you have to do anterior radial cuts as well. And uh, when the weak zonal CTRs are useful, we implanted them in 16%. So to conclude, in RP, we, we do have different phenotypes, but um, many of them, actually, not all of them, definitely, just maybe the stages of the natural history when you see the patient. So it's ring patch atrophy story, which actually will uh, probably be the case in most of the cases. Uh, don't do fluorescent angiography on these patients anymore. Fluorescent angiography is even um, dangerous and, and, and can actually cause a lot of problems. And uh, autofluorescence and OCT are far more informative and treat CME and cataract and genetics, of course, will usually solve the riddles. But as I, saw, as I showed you, some the same genotypes may have very different phenotypes and vice versa. So look out for also non-genetic disease, so um, like vitamin A, MAR, autoimmune retinopathy, or Betten's disease that was shown this morning uh, and yesterday. And... Uh, what to tell the patient, never predict blindness. They don't say you will be blind in five years, but uh, if they have concentric RP, so you, you may you know, see for many years. And uh, if they're involved in macula, then of course you have to prepare them early enough. So thank you very much again. It was a real pleasure to be with you for this couple of days. I wouldn't, almost didn't leave the room. It was so interesting, thank you. Any questions for Professor Haulina? Yes, please, Paris. Do you have a microphone? Okay. No, we just start with drops now. Yeah, yeah. If it doesn't work, we switch, and uh, if it still doesn't work, we sometimes combine. But there's no study actually to show combined effect of both. No, we, we just, just leave them on drugs or zolomites, yeah, forever. And also, probably reducing pressure is okay for the vascular su supply of the eye. It's better vascularization, I don't know. And do you think that uh, in other forms of CMO, like in uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the disguise, some effect is also seen there, yes, <clears throat> and it's been published, but uh, probably not so large effect.
It never gets quite dry there. Andreas? Yeah. How can the, you explain this? I don't know. I, I, I don't know really how, but uh, it's interesting. That That's what papers actually found. Uh, so it's apparently something that deals with uh, post-operative situation, which you induce in the eye. I'm, I'm not sure what, actually. Post Maybe, Mike, you know, any comments on that? No, I'm afraid I don't have a have a yeah. reason for that. It, it might be just an ascertainment bias. Yeah. I don't know if it's a real thing. Yeah, but it's been published. Sure. Yeah, no, no, yeah, because sure. you normally think that you in some times uh, you expect uh, CMO yeah. postoperatively. That's right. So uh, you have uh, the uh, macular yeah. edema in RP. So yeah. why it's less frequent <laughs> if yes, it's not that, combined? That is the fear, isn't it? I mean, if you go on and operate early to and then. The patient develops CME, you are not doing a good thing, and that was a major fear actually against it. But really, the, it's another paper that shows that CME occurrence is actually lower than in normal cataracts after the, the surgery. So the benefit should probably overweigh you know, the, the risks. Uh, so in our series, it was only 5%, actually, and it was treatable and went back. Yes. We never did angiography, yeah. And I would completely agree. I mean, you shouldn't be put off from doing cataract surgery because of the fear of development of macular edema or the, or the pre-existence of macular edema you haven't been able to resolve pre-operatively. These patients do well, and in my experience, the, the macular edema will resolve post-operatively. Mm. Um, I, I tend to advise, if they have pre-existing macular edema that we haven't been able to... Um, resolve with treatment with topical or oral agents, then I, I recommend that the cataract surgeon uses intravitreal trimacinolone at the time of cataract surgery. That's the only time I uh, feel comfortable using steroids in patients with um, RP. And then postoperatively, I advise them to tail off the usual topicals that you would do with cataract surgery over a longer period of time, and I also get them to use Acular. Could you tell us a little bit more about ILEA study you did? Yeah, I know for sure. Um, so it was 30 patients, um, uh, treat and extend protocol with ILEA. Um, they had a, a loading phase of, of five injections, um, monthly injections, and then a treat and extend. Of those 30 patients, 10 patients responded uh, favorably. So a third of the patients with um, RP, CMO that had previously failed other modalities. So all patients recruited had failed other modalities and had, had chronic CMO. So I guess you're starting out with a, a pretty tricky uh, group of patients to treat. Um, and of those 10 that responded, um, nine of the 10 responded after a, a, the first injection. So they had a dramatic response after just one injection. So mm -hmm. that's helpful to know that you can, for most cases, predict response just after one injection. Well, in our case, it was like two months, nothing happened. The third month, we were thinking whether to, to repeat it, and then all of a sudden, it started to go away, and it remained dry ever since. We, I mean, we injected bivacizumab, uh, but it was a sort of a sort of not RP. It was a, like a cone rod dystrophy. But um, I think it's much, uh, how to say, um, it's much more... Uh, gentle to, to do anti-VGF than Ozodex to the eye. I think, you know, you induce high pressure, induce cataract, and, you Yeah, know, no, I'd completely agree. I'm really not a fan probably. of Ozodex in, yeah. in RP. I'm probably not a fan of Ozodex full stop, but definitely not in RP. Is there any explanation why the anti-VGF, I mean, those patients respond better than the VGF, the same Yeah, good question. But we, we, normal, yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't, between, I mean, these are small numbers, of course, you know, 30 patients, 10 compared to 10 responders, 20 who didn't. We didn't see any obvious reason why those 10 responders did respond. Um, a couple of them had had macular edema for almost 10 years. Um, so we weren't able to tease out why some responded and others didn't, but we, were, we thought it was helpful that at least you could work out if there was a responder pretty much after one injection. So it's not that you have to commit the patient to a dozen injections to work out whether they're going to respond or not. It was only the one of the 10 that took several injections and they responded after the fifth or sixth. And obviously, I, I not obviously, but, but I set the bar quite high in terms of 
these patients received a lot of injections to really make sure that it wasn't an under-treatment reason that they didn't respond. So if they didn't respond, they're, they're not going to respond. Ask question by Dimitris. Uh, you said that uh, your target uh, post-op refraction will be uh, minus 3 or minus 5. And my question is, uh, do you do that in all patients, regardless of their uh, VA status, or you do that only in myops or only in those who have poor vision? You know, today their life is, uh, and probably not only at the day of operation, but, but further on, their life is actually confined to telephone. So what they do is, you know, they have telephone. And, and even if they lose vision totally, they, they have these programs on different telephones that they will be using. So, so I think for the future, this is something wise to invest uh, because they would probably, you know, hate putting glasses every time on. Now, whether or not you want to do that, you should also ask the patient. It's, of course, important. However, most of my patients like to use glasses for distance and uh, read without them. And, and I, would, I would completely agree. My experience has been that the patients who are really unhappy is when they haven't been left myopic. So, uh, Professor, what's your personal criteria to get rid of the cataract? I mean, you get rid of every cataract in RP patients, I mean. Yes, um, well, it's, if it's really a small cataract and quite preserved visual field, of course, that would probably not be the case. But if a very narrow visual field, like five degrees, three degrees, and you have a little of a, of a cataract, that's, that's quite disturbing, and they tell you that. And they tell you that um, light is even more disturbing because, you know, they, for some reason, even, even when they get almost totally blind with some retained peripheral vision, Many of these patients are, are extremely photophobic. I don't know how to explain that. But, uh, for example, we have one piano player that is uh, X-linked and has gone uh, fully blind. And just, just when, she, when he, when he um, graduated the, the, the music school, and he's a genius. Um, he's totally blind. He just has a little bit of it. And peripheral vision. We invited him once to, to, to play for us in the Congress for the opening, and it was a big, nice hall with, you know, view to the sea in Port Roche, um, and he said, could you please make the room dark? So, you know, I can't, you know, I can't play. It's interesting. I'd, I'd agree that I find glare really helpful, so when I ask patients about glare, um, I use that to help decide whether the cataract is, is, um, is reducing the vision or whether it's down to retinal failure. Um, it, it's, it's important to manage the expectations and even when you go through the process, the patients will, won't really hear the fact that you're, what you're going to improve after cataract surgery. But these patients, if you ask them, will say that you know, they're having to wear shades even when it's overcast. Um, so I, I find glare useful. So it's also massive fibrosis sometimes of the capsule postoperatively, yeah, so you have, yeah. to, you have to look for them early and do some radial cuts because I just had a patient that, that was seen, uh, operated about six months ago. I've seen her first month and then in, in another month, and now she came like three months later, and actually her, she, she had very small phimosis, and uh, IOL haptics were totally twisted, and, and I had, you know, really a massive yak to, to actually, you know, make, make uh, optic axis again. Uh, so you patient. operate even mild so cataracts? Look, look, for them, look for them early. Follow up early. Yeah. And another question. Uh, what about uh, refractive surgery and uh, RP? Well, I don't think that's, <laughs> I don't think that goes, goes along, uh, you know, except there for are this minus three to minus five, but this is some sort of refractive yeah, surgery. There are patients who insist to get rid of their myopia. Yeah, they are, well. I don't know. I, I, yeah, I, mean, I, I generally try and dissuade them. I generally try and dissuade them, but um, I, you know, I, I don't know of definite evidence that the, the, the procedure itself is harmful to their RP progression. I mean, you could, you could theorize it. It could be. You could theorize it. It wouldn't, but um, there's no good evidence. But I tend to try and dissuade. No good evidence, yes. Tony, let's move to next okay. speaker, Tony Robson.